Thank you. Kusunum Sapin. Um, I hope it will be amazing. I'm, I'm going to explore some ideas um, around, well, I think they're ideas that are not new to us, but maybe we're putting something that's been in the background to the front and looking at the idea of building capital, uh, social capital, cultural capital through the work we do with singing. And certainly as a music educator and a community music musician, I'm interested in that. So I've written a, a script to keep me on task, but I will depart from it probably too much. Let me start with this. Last Friday, I attended a performance of Bach's St. John's Passion, the 1725 version, in our local symphonic hall. Our region has a population of about a half a million people, and we are one hour west of Toronto, Canada's largest city. In our mid-sized city, we have a professional orchestra, a beautiful concert hall that seats over 2,000 people, a symphonic choir of about 100 composed of, of volunteers, and um, each Good Friday, they will present either uh, one of the two Passions of Bach or the B minor Mass. Um, the symphony soloists in the hall are paid professional fees, but the choir produces the concert. The singers actually pay out of their own pockets for the privilege of singing. I frame the, the pic, the, this uh, paper today. Let's try it this way. There we go. I frame this lecture today, a professional concert with a full hall of patrons, on one of the most sacred days of the Christian calendar, listening to a great artwork that plums the depths of Christ's experience during that brutal week. The music is genius, the setting is purposeful, one might even say overly managed with every attention to detail. So I left the concert thinking about the areas of which I've been researching and digging around, matters of connections between culture and arts and what are some are calling social innovation, or cultural entrepreneurship, I found myself musing about the bottom line here. What was the value of this event, or any such event? Is it enough to conclude that value or profit is enough, that the choristers gain the satisfaction of accomplishment, a great performance with artistic and historic integrity, knowing they were able to work with great musicians? Maybe they even felt good that they generated some income for these musicians. Is the value in the audience engagement? The audience was engaged, they listened, they stood to their feet and gave a great ovation. They left into this night of darkness quite solemnly and quietly. What more could one ask for? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that such an event as a choral concert like this is a means of building cultural capital. And it meets the three criteria um, that was outlined by the French philosopher Pierre Bourdieu as recently as 1986, in which he categorizes cultural capital as embodiment, objectified, and institutionalized. I'm going to go back and re review this in some detail. So we'll park that idea for now, and um, we'll, we'll go deeply into the notion that singing is a vitally important human practice, but sometimes we don't really understand fully why it's so important. So very briefly, we're going to explore two fundamental questions pertaining to the relationship between choral singing and human beings. The first one, and my early research is around the impact of singing on people. So why do people choose to sing? My later work is more of the impact on communities. How does choral singing uh, impact communities? The paper will conclude by espousing some core values that music education and community music is built upon, including the belief that choral music reaches out to all who, in, to include all who wish to participate and ultimately to enhance the well-being of the whole person. Experience tells us that much of our work in the academy is the training of choral directors. Much of what we heard about this morning in uh, Professor um, Kolar's uh, talk directors in becoming skilled, efficient, and technically accurate musicians. We are masters at getting the music right. The recipe for success is, among other things, to focus on the correct pronunciation, vowel uniformity, articulation, phrasing, balance, and precision. In short, we are brilliant mistake eliminators.
this became really clear to me, uh, uh, reinforced this year in my university, where young choral scholars under my supervision repeatedly would dive into leading rehearsals with full attention to the musical details in the score. Even matters of text were secondary, and certainly matters of personal impact, societal or cultural effects were not even on their radar. They haven't been, as they have been trained, their ultimate task was to get the notes right. We are best at serving the composer, the score, and the audience. And I'm not saying these are not noble goals. They are not goals to discard or disown. However, today I want to talk more about the singing rather than the song. Uh, we might think the process rather than the end product. And in the singing, we begin with the basic question, why do people sing? Why do they invest their time, their resources, their vacations, their days off, and even their own reputation to experience choral singing? We might think, well, they want to become better singers, or they want to learn new music, or they love their conductor. Those were my predictions when I began a longitudinal study quite a few years ago with a community choir. We observed, interviewed, surveyed, got them to open up, and in some cases reveal the deeper places of their heart and mind. With hours of transcribed interviews and impact surveys over a year of engagement, four major pillars emerged as to why people dedicate so much of their time to singing. The first came through as choir as community. This was Dr. Freund's last point yesterday when he talked about the need to establish and maintain small communities. A choir is a virtual community. It's a community of, that brings people together that often would not be together in the same place ever other than the fact that they're coming together to sing. And um, this is expressed in this need for a sense of belonging to a community and place that is particularly wanting as people strive to connect, become rooted, and seek for that larger than self experience. I'm going to drill through this pretty fast, and I apologize for the amount of words on the screen, but <coughs> words seem to be where we're at t today. <laughs> the second pillar was a qu choir as a means of self identity. When asked the question, Who am I? many of our singers would say, Well, I'm Mary, I'm a social worker, I'm a mother of four, and I sing alto. They would include that descriptor in their self-definition. They were proud of the fact they could add that they were a singer in a choir to their sense of self-identity. Yet there's that lurking question in the background, are you sure? We're always seeking for the story that fully describes who we are. A um, couple of more points. A choir member said, I'm going to back up. I'm not going to back up. We're moving on. <laughs> the third pillar was choir as a means of wholeness, restoration, healing. And um, I have a quote here, if I live close enough to myself, in quotes, that I can be moved, my personhood opens up and I can be receptive to experiences that might be described as transcendental. That also f falls nicely into what Dr. Freund said yesterday about nurturing and generating that sense of inner world, that inner space. There's a human yearning to be creative, to be artistic, to experience that presence in our lives. But oftentimes, through the drilling of musical excellence and um, the precision of becoming a great musician, we deprive ourselves of that opportunity. The fourth pillar was choir as a means of developing artistic discernment, or I called it connoisseurship. It's a form of self-knowledge. It's, it's a pride of knowing quality, being able to discern quality, R reflection in action processes, the quality of experience in music making. One of the participants said, I love that we can sight read music at a very high caliber and get it right to the musical artistic features of the pieces. That's more than just getting the mistakes out of the way. I'll let you read that. You know you don't have the answers, but somehow through the music, through your community together, you find your way. We sing as we are able. 
So we conclude that people choose to sing for many reasons, but without a doubt, the experience of singing impacts the participant in social, psychological, and spiritual dimensions. And perhaps the byproduct of all of this is they actually do become good mistake eliminators, learn new music, and perhaps even learn to love their conductor. This is um, an art installation piece that's built on the $20 bill in Canadian currency. In Side the maple leaf on the left-hand side is this quote. Could we ever know each other in the slightest without the arts? Gabriel Roy is a well-known Canadian author and poet. This was installed in our art gallery in our university. And um, the irony is obvious. Arts and money are in constant tension with each other. And the bottom line culture where everything of value is commodified we sometimes say in Canada, if it's worth anything, you can buy it at the mall. In fact, we know that this is a tension for us in the arts. Uh, artists offer, often find ourselves relegated to the margins. We're often outside of the center. Yet I argue that music in the lives of members of our society is a positive form of capital. We might consider it to be social capital. It certainly is culturally positive. And as we've noted earlier, it enhances the lives of people in many ways. So how is choral singing a form of capital in a social cultural perspective? The, the term cultural capital was first introduced by the, the French sociologist and philosopher Pierre Bourdieu in, seven, in 1973. And um, I, I think I've said these things. Here we are. Um, he suggests that there's a connection between artistic preferences that strongly tie in with their social position. So people choose cultural things that are commensurate with their place in society. Cultural capital refers to assets such as competencies, skills, and qualifications. And cultural capital is a form that enables holders to mobilize cultural authority. Uh, I'm not going to go into the theory much more than that other than I will explain uh, the three categories slightly. B Bourdieu suggests that embodied cultural capital are those abilities, talents, styles, languages, values, creative labor such as writers, painters, film makers, etc. Um, this falls in quite neatly to with what Richard Florida calls members of the core creative class. And these properties may be consciously acquired or passively inherited. The second um, category of Bourdieu is objectified cultural capital. These are the artifacts. So the embodied are the, the actions, the abilities, the agents of making these things. But the objectified cultural capital are the things we value. Our music, our architecture, our art, our poetry, our stories. That is our cultural capital that we consider objectified. It's a result of conscious creative activity produced by individuals, groups, expressed cultural identity, may or may not be commodified. You might be able to go out and buy this stuff and consume by others if it's deemed valuable by consumers. The third area is the institutionalized cultural capital. This is, these are structures that may enhance an individual or group's social or economic position. It could be a music academy. It could be a symphony orchestra. It could be a government institution. But there are things that enable people to move up and down the hierarchical ladder in terms of their power within cultural capital. We, so we have a theoretical framework here. And what I'm going to try to do is very briefly connect this idea of cultural capital or sociocultural capital to our interest in singing, and especially the corporate practice of choral singing. If we embed the practice of music education through singing in Bourdieu's three categories, we can form a, a type of matrix in terms of singing as having cultural importance. So I've, I, I'm a bit of a sucker for alliteration. You'll forgive me for this. I once gave a, a keynote speech, and I did my thing with alliteration. And somebody who was high, highly regarded as a, a leader in rhetoric said to me, there are two things that are regarded weak uh, in terms of speaking. One is to deal with etymology all the time. And the second one is to deal in terms of alliteration. 
and I was guilty on both counts. But she did say my speech was okay. So the first is, I'm considering that choral singing is a form of culture bearing. What do we mean by that? We mean that it upholds, preserves, and makes evident to others the key human values and processes that through human expression we name as a culture or our culture. So we privilege artworks, we make them available through concerts, common cultural practices, folk songs, traditions, institutions. We elevate the normal, everyday things to a special place through culture bearing. The second B is the role of choral singing as culture builder. And this is where, uh, and I so appreciated Joy's um, lecture yesterday on the idea of composing for singers through creative work, scholarship, research, exploration, culture is born. It's nurtured, it's established, it's disseminated. These processes are at the very core of creating, preparing, and performing choral music, especially when there's a relationship with a composer or a commission with a composer. And just an interesting statistic, rather, if we think that um, people in general are not participating in culture. A survey was done in 2013 in Canada that reported that three in four Canadians attended some live cultural performance within that year. And I had no idea. I really didn't believe it. The third area for me is, a, is the exciting one. And this is the idea of a choral singing or music education through choral music as a culture broker. This is uh, an area that facilitates the border crossing of another person or group of people from one culture to another culture. There's a lot of talk about boundary bridging and border crossing. And I don't know if you've ever had a chance to work. Typically, as choral directors, we're in the center of the circle. And the kids, and our singers, are in the boundaries. They're on the edges, literally, in the room. But if you move from the center to the boundaries, you move into a very interesting place. The interesting things are happening at the borders, at the edges, at the perimeters. That's where the vitality and the interest and the texture of our work takes place. So it, we're working here with the idea of um, defined culture broking as the act of bridging, border crossing, the idea of linking or mediating between groups or persons of differing cultural backgrounds for the purpose of reducing conflict or producing change. I think we've heard a lot about that these last three days. Choral singing as part of the human practice of creative cultural endeavors is a partner in sustaining, in the sustaining of our cultural capital through bearing, building, and brokering. Humans sing together and by their very act, and often tacitly, are capable of enacting change informing and shaping community values, and enriching the overall creative and robust community life. Now, perhaps I'm going to overreach a little bit here towards utopia, but I'm going to ask this question. Could we ever get to this? Where the role of the arts can play in addressing the fault lines of modern society, the deep and perplexing problems that beset contemporary life. They would include such things as where the significance on the economy is the most important measure of meaning, where our reliance on the economy, I, I'm sorry, I said that. The significance we ascribe to instrumental reasoning which can calculate the cost, but not the value of everything. And then the second one, our reliance on the economy is the most important measure meaning. The diminished sense of community in a world dominated by individualism and fear of the other. Our neglect, even at times disdain for the intangible, the difficult to measure, the intrinsic values, human feeling, inventiveness and imagination, and life of the spirit. Is it possible, these are what we're describing as fault lines or problems in modern society, can the arts address that? We have a foundation in Canada called Musagetis, and I've adapted these ideas from their manifesto, their declaration. 
there are people out there, there are organizations out there working to balance modern life. And again, I, the echoes of Dr. Freund's talk on the neurology and the value of the arts are, are, are very cogent here. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the economic side, but the business community has their eye on us. What do they think about us? Um, a study was done in Canada last year called The Next Big Bang Music Education, and it was done by the Information Technology and Communication Council of Canada, a not-for-profit, non-government agency that deals with the IT sector and tracks employment in the IT sector. They're suggesting that the most employable candidate for their sector is someone who's been trained in music or educated in music. And they're considering that um, the connection to the creation of cultural scenes support not only a thriving music community, but a deep pool of talent and fertile environment for the information and communication technology industries. I hate to put this person's picture in my slideshow because he's a government official in Canada, but he did say something valuable. Investing in the arts and culture is investing in the economy. So when you have a top-level cabinet minister saying that, you can hold him to that quote, I think, except in our present government, we can't seem to do that. Um, there's a choir in Kitchener, our neighboring city to Waterloo, called the Age of Majority Singers. They're made up of all generations of, of singers, but many of them come from a high-tech hub, which is adjacent to the place they re rehearse. This is where Google headquarters is, high-tech, communitech, desire to learn. All of these high-tech uh, companies are in this work hub across the street, and on Wednesday nights, she has about 80 people from teenagers to parents and grandparents singing. And they do it because they seek choral singing to enrich their lives, which are oftentimes in another part of their thinking apparatus. They're looking at creative problem solving, designing ideas. Somehow singing tends to calibrate the thinking of, the, of their everyday work. And I'm going to do more work with them. They've, uh, they've just finishing their second year of existence and They've made a splash. I just want to move now very quickly by conclusion in, to give you four examples of choral singing as cultural capital moving into the area of activism and justice. Just a couple of years ago, this scenario in Norway where they gathered by the tens of thousands aiming to face down terror with the power of music Empowered by a Facebook organized prote protest, Norwegians flocked to public squares across the country, ignored the drenching rain, and lifted their voices in song. Their target, the fanatic Anders Beren Breivik, the accused bomber and murderer of some 77 innocent people. Their weapon, a children's tune that he claimed had been used to brainwash the country's youth into supporting immigration. It was Pete Seeger's Children of the Rainbow, sung in Norwegian, a sky full of stars, Blue sea as far as you can see, an earth where flowers grow. Can you wish for more? Together shall we live, every sister, brother, young children of the rainbow, a fertile land. It's amazing that such a simple, pretty little song could galvanize the anger and grief of a nation while simultaneously giving voice to their deep expression of justice and core values. Let's explore another moment in history where music became the means to meeting an insurmountable challenge. The revolution started in the summer of 1987 when mass protests by the Estonian people began against Russian occupation of their country. In the June evenings of that year, over 10,000 people a night packed the Tallinn Song Festival grounds where they sang patriotic and national songs, songs that were forbidden by the Soviet regime. And I'm sorry I spelled Tallinn wrong. In September of 1988, 300,000 Estonians gathered to continue their protest and to hear Trevimi Velesti make the first public demand for independence. The years from 87 to 91 were filled with numerous such public demonstrations, as well as a great deal of political maneuverings, the sum of which has become known as the Singing Revolution. On 20th of August 1991, Estonian politicians declared the nation's independence, even as Soviet tanks were rolling through the countryside to quell the movement. 
Singing, that uniquely human practice that uses an instrument given to all of us at birth, can enact justice, calm anger, bridge mighty chasms between opposing forces, and most important of all, heal our spirits. One more example. On December the 7th, 1914, Pope Benedict the 15 suggested a temporary hiatus of the war for the celebration of Christmas. Though Germany readily agreed, the other powers refused. On Christmas Eve, many German soldiers put up Christmas trees decorated with candles on the parapets of their trenches. Hundreds of Christmas trees lighted the German trenches, and although British soldiers could see the lights, it took them a few minutes to figure out what they were from. Could this be a trick? British soldiers were ordered not to fire, but to watch them closely. Instead of trickery, the British soldiers heard many of the Germans celebrating. One soldier reported that time and time again during the course of that day, the eve of Christmas, they were, there were wafted towards us from the trenches opposite the sounds of singing and merrymaking and even the exchanging of Christmas carols. They finished their carol and we thought that we ought to retaliate. It was war after all, so we sang the first Noel. And when we finished that, they began clapping in. They struck up another favorite of theirs, O Tannenbaum. And so it went on. First the Germans who would sing one of their carols, and then we would sing one of ours, until when we started up O Come All Ye Faithful, and the Germans immediately joined singing the same hymn to the Latin words, Adeste Fidelis. And I thought, well, this was really a most extraordinary thing. Two nations both singing the same carol in the middle of a war. After this incident, the Allied forces pulled these British soldiers from the front lines since they were deemed as unfit. They were contaminated by peaceful feelings. Singing brought a temporary peace in the midst of horrible conflict. Dr. Higgins, Dr. Lee Higgins has suggested that making music together is an act of hospitality. It's a chance to say yes. We're working on a, building a theoretical model for community music and education at Laurier University in Waterloo. And we're doing so on these principles, the foundation of loving kindness, a demand for justice, a journey towards wholeness, results in building of social capital, cultural capital, and can lead to social innovation and change. Recently, we had an economist visit our university to speak to our whole faculty about social innovation. This is a bean counter, a, a number cruncher from an American university. He started his keynote address quite haltingly by reading a chapter from the Bible. Clearly, he wasn't a religious man. He didn't find the words tripping off his tongue very readily, but it was 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I am useless. And he went on to talk. I thought, how curious that an economist would begin a keynote address on social innovation by reading that chapter. And then he said, essentially, I will summarize his 30-minute keynote in one sentence. He said, the role of universities in the role of education is to teach empathy and critical thinking full stop. And I thought, my goodness, you know, we go back to drilling our students with all of these things about getting it right and the fear of judgment of each other, peer judgment and, and professors judging, teachers judging, parents and, and community. And this whole idea is a new paradigm for us to think about. Um, currently, right now, we're working with an, in another project. Throughout history in Canada, the way the, co the colonists or the settlers, as we're known, have treated the Aboriginal peoples is maybe our private little secret. It's an atrocity. More recently, in the past decade, more than 700 Native women have gone missing, and only a fraction of their cases has made its way into our judicial system so that justice can be enacted. In my region of Waterloo, a group of women formed a singing drum circle known as the Good Hearted Women Drum Circle. And for the purpose of learning ritual songs, seasonal ceremonies, and to help build bridges between cultures through song, and specifically to keep a public focus on the missing women or the sto stolen sisters as we know them. Each of these women are on a path of healing through singing. 
they have reached out to us, the settler cultures, the dominant and often abusing cultures, in order to uh, bring healing and restoration to broken relationships through song. This is just a fragment of them at one of our events called Sing Fires of Justice, an annual event we have. And this is the good-hearted women singers of the Mine Ode Cuevac Negamawak, as the Ojibwe language calls them. In the interest of time, uh, that we have an hour and a half online. You can Google Sing Fires of Justice and uh, get the whole service or public event that included community choirs singing with them, an Aboriginal elder speaking. It was, um, so this is a connection of, of border brokering or um, culture brokering through singing. So I just conclude by revisiting the four pillars as to why people sing, and ultimately, we explore this more deeply. I'm just giving you a, a little surface journey through some of our thinking currently, but I believe very strongly, not really in a utopian way, but really in a tangible way, that one by one together, uh, the world is better because we sing. And I thank you. I have no idea where we are in the timeline, so if, if anyone wants to ask or comment, I'm open to that. <laughs> if they sing, the right, right, and right. That's still very uh, uh, efficient in us the way we are dealing with all the situation of work and organization and cooperation. So that's really very good, very connected to this. Yeah. Thank you. I think we probably must move on. Is that your thinking too? <laughs>